it is just a couple minutes after four, but we've got it all figured out now, I think. Um, so glad that you guys could come. I'm gonna kind of go slow for a minute as Brent is posting the live video onto, um, I think right in the event and on the page, that way wherever people click, they can find it. Um, I know I heard from a lot of you that you were kind of gathering ingredients and everything, and I know it kind of seems like a lot of different things that we're doing, um, and maybe a little bit ambitious, but I was trying to kind of think about, you know, what we need right now, and basically, we're kind of at the point in quarantine where we don't want our food to be just about a chore or just about nutrition or a need anymore. We kind of want it to be special again um, because food makes things special. We celebrate our occasions by going out for you know a special meal. We have parties centered around food and making it beautiful. Um, people go to tasting after tasting to figure out what to share with their guests for their wedding or for their cake and you know so food makes us feel special and we're at a point where we need it to feel special again um you know we're we gather around the table and we spend more time when it's something that we have put more time into and we're kind of desperate for an occasion right now um you know, so as I was deciding, I was trying to think about, obviously, what can I expect the majority of people to have on hand in their kitchen right now? Um, you know, we're kind of, not feast or famine by any means, but like, right after we get that grocery delivery, it's like, woo, we're going to make all these different things, and then the week goes on, and, uh, you know, you start running out of staples, or you, you know, you don't have the ability to go out and get certain fresh things or special things, so... You know, I was trying to think about what you guys would have on hand and then what would help you the most. And, um, you know, obviously, of course, came to mind, you know, maybe some new sides or um, some family meals, something that doesn't take two hours to prepare from beginning to end. Um, and as I was thinking about that, you know, that all made sense. That was all very, you know, sensible, but we don't need sensible right now. We need something to celebrate. So my hope is that um, you at least have the ingredients for a few of the things that we're going to make and that, um, you know, you can take some ordinary things, turn them into something pretty, shake up a few cocktails, and turn an ordinary night into a celebration. So that's what we're doing here at least. Um, I'm going to try and kind of be cool and pay attention to what you guys are saying so that way if um, you have any questions just let me know um, I'm gonna try not to go too quickly through everything either um, so slow me down if you need to and also just you know cuz I did add a couple things that I didn't tell you about so um, if you have a couple carrots or a cucumber um, we are gonna do a quick pickle to go on this tray because I was kind of looking at things and we really needed something a little bit punchy. So we are gonna do a quick pickle. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go through the knife skills first and start putting everything together. Some of the things need to be cooked down for a little bit longer, so we'll get to that. And um, don't worry, the cocktail will be in about 20 minutes. So, <laughs> But we are gonna start by just, um, if you have, like I said, if you have carrots, we'll just peel a couple of these guys. You don't have to peel them for pickles, obviously. Um, we've got some nice fiber in our carrot peel, but they do kind of take on a little bit more vibrant of a color and look a little bit prettier when we peel them. So we might not even be able to fit all of this into a jar. What I'm gonna do is do mine into just like a little mason jar because then I can pour my liquid right over the top and pickle them right in the jar and they'll cool while we're making everything else and be ready by the time we're ready to eat. Um, a couple things that I have set up here, I have my knives, um, I use a bench scraper, it's the safest way to kind of move ingredients or scraps, that way you know, you're never taking that sharp blade of your knife and putting it near your hand. Um, and then I also have a garbage bowl. So I'll give you guys a second if you want to grab out a little bowl. It's the easiest way to kind of get rid of scraps as you go versus running back and forth to your garbage can. Um, I'm totally not keeping up with any questions. <laughs> Let's kind of do this real quick. Okay, nobody asked any. <laughs> Update. Okay, 
So we'll trim off the ends of our carrot. And a couple things, because I want to make sure that, you know, you guys are getting some tips on knife skills and stuff. No matter what your knife is, what brand or anything like that, there's a spot where the blade and the handle meet. You want to just kind of pinch that spot and then grip underneath and you'll have a lot of control and you'll have a lot of balance. Um, go ahead and just kind of put your finger across the top and notice how you lose at least half of your balance and a lot of your control. So try to kind of train yourself to hold it like this. And then with your non-cutting hand, you want to really tuck your fingers and your thumb in and that way whatever you're cutting, you might be guiding your knife with your knuckles but you never have your fingertips in the way. Um, and it might sound kind of silly but a carrot is one of the trickiest things to cut because it's round. Um, potatoes, you know, anything like that, we're kind of going against whatever the carrot wants to do. And so because of that, what I'm gonna show you guys real quick to make it safer is find a little flat edge from where we peeled and just shave a little extra off the side. And by a little, I really mean a little, but you can get it to where it doesn't roll at all. And that's what we really want. So get it to that point. We'll split it down the center. As soon as you have enough leverage, go ahead and just put your fingertips on top instead of, you know, on the actual carrot. And I'm going to probably go thirds with this size. We're looking for nice little carrot sticks. Actually, I'll do quarters because if I'm thinking about, you know, eating a cheese tray, I want to get a little slice of carrot, not a big piece. You're going to hear Joseph in the background throughout this. He did not nap today. And, uh, you know, we'll just see how he does. So I'm just going to real quick, I already have a flat side on that one, kind of go through. And the other just couple little things that we'll need for these pickles are just um, some white vinegar or apple cider vinegar if you have it. Um, bit of sugar, a couple peppercorns. Um, if you have dill, you can throw it in. You know, when we have everything at our disposal, we can add so many different things. Some mustard seeds, a couple sliced garlic cloves, um, fresh dill or dried dill, all sorts of fun things. You can make a Vietnamese pickle. Um, you could add in half of a hot pepper and over time that'll just, you know, give a little bit of extra spice to it. All that good stuff. So, I'm going to Go ahead and over at my stove, I already threw a couple of those things in. I just did sugar, vinegar, and some peppercorns. I'm gonna turn it on low and just dissolve the sugar into there. Um, we heat the liquid so that we can dissolve the sugar, but also the heat is what's gonna do the quick pickling. You know, this isn't something that we're putting in our cabinet for a couple weeks. Before we get flavor, we're gonna have this within a couple of hours. Where do I, oh, okay. I have my jar. If you don't have a jar, you can just use any kind of like a glass vessel. But this works perfectly because then this is what I'll serve on my tray. So when we're setting up like a pretty tray and we want to have, you know, some wow factor to it, height is one of the things we want to think about. So a lot of the things that we put on the tray are kind of just an inch or two off of the tray. So adding anything that adds some height kind of, you know, creates some visibility and something to look at. Got some dill around here. I'll just throw a little bit of this kind of into the sides and kind of cram it down. Maybe I'll use a carrot stick to do that. Um, if you've been out foraging for ramps, you could throw some ramps into these pickles. That would be nice. Um, anything like that. All right. Hi, Dad. Okay, so we'll set this aside and we'll wait until that liquid is kind of boiling and we'll just pour it over the top and set it to cool. And while we are waiting on that, we're gonna start getting some things together for our chutney. Um, a chutney is basically something that has a lot of different flavors. So we have sweet, we have salty, we have um, usually a little bit of bitter, there's lots of different spices. Um, it's kind of meant to be a really warm, um, accompaniment. So we'll be using things like ginger, garlic, onion, but then on the other side of it, if you have an apple or a pear, any kind of a dried fruit added in is 
really, you know, pretty typical. Um, and then, you know, some hot pepper, some cinnamon, some different things that kind of add different levels. And then when we finish it, we finish it with some sour. So we finish it with a little bit of a vinegar and a little bit of mustard. So it takes like 40 minutes for it to kind of cook down. So we're gonna just kind of prep those ingredients and get them in the pan as well, have them ready. So we're gonna start off and we're gonna kind of chop every bit of garlic that we'll need for all the rest of the stuff we're doing all at once. So if you wanna grab, I'd say like five cloves, we're gonna get those minced up. And I have a fun little tool that helps me take all the skin off the cloves so I might move a little faster. Um, but just go ahead, you know, sometimes it's already splitting. If it's super fresh, it's kind of really stuck to the clove. So you'll need to work with it a little bit more. But even if you don't have the roller, you can kind of smash it up against your board and kind of get that loosened a little bit. So how many people are cooking and how many people are watching and how many people are just waiting for the cocktail? Or who didn't wait for the cocktail? <laughs> All right, I have some bad spots on I'm gonna trim those off. I'll also trim that top part that was attached to the root. And then for everything that we're making, we're just mincing it. So for mincing, you just want to really kind of get a nice small piece. So we're going to just do some slices. And then we'll go back and cut from there. everything we're doing is savory because now my board's going to smell like garlic. So I usually go back and kind of cut into like nice little strips that then I can turn and just mince up real quickly. So I'll go through and do that. Oh yay! Awesome. Kim's cooking with your daughter. That's fun. <laughs> I love it, Matt. I'm guessing maybe you didn't wait on the cocktail. I approve. Okay, so this seems like a lot of garlic, but what we're gonna do is put it in a little bowl and we'll set it aside and then every time we need garlic for the rest of everything we're doing, we'll just grab from that. Um, which is something that I kind of try and do in general when I'm cooking. It seems like I'm always making like three or four things at the same time, so may as well chop the same thing just once. You can turn it and start kind of using that curve of your knife, you can also do what's called the rock and chop, where you bring just about to your first joint on your fingertips and kind of hold your knife steady while you turn in a quarter turn. Um, garlic's really sticky and it'll stick to your knife, so just kind of use your bench scraper and then bring it all back together. I'm gonna real quick just grab that vinegar. So, the safest way is to just kind of lower it into your sink and you can pour right in. And that was like the perfect amount of liquid. So I've got these guys all set and ready. I'm gonna just set them on the counter to cool. I just inhaled a huge whiff of vinegar, not my favorite. Um, we're gonna rinse out this can because this is the perfect size for a chutney too. Set back up. All right, so I have just a tiny bit more chopping to do on my garlic, and then I'm gonna get it into a container, and we'll start chopping up our onions. So for the vinegar, I used three quarters of a cup of vinegar to a quarter cup of sugar, and it was kind of just the right amount to cover all of our carrots in that jar, too. Okay, so we got our garlic. I'm gonna get that in our little cup. Cooking and waiting. Awesome. Very good. Okay, so we got plenty. 
plenty of garlic to set that aside and we're gonna get um, some onions going so for our little cheese mixture that we're doing we're gonna caramelize onions and caramelize onions they take a while they take 30 to 40 minutes to really get out the color that we want so we'll get that started we want to have it kind of on a low temperature just going the whole time um, and as far as our cheese so I had said you know if you have ricotta or goat cheese or cream cheese any kind of like a soft cheese um, if it's like a cream cheese or a goat cheese go ahead and pull that out of the fridge and let it kind of get to room temperature while we're working too it'll make it easier hi bud I know. Okay, so for caramelized onions, we're just slicing them, so no intense method here. We'll just do some nice thin slices. You got it? That was like 20 minutes he was happy, so that's cool. <laughs> that's how it normally goes. Okay, so I'm just gonna cut it in half. And kind of following the ribs, just do some nice thin slices. And we're gonna do the whole onion this way. Um, it seems like a lot for just, you know, topping a little herbed cheese with, but, um, they cook down so much over the caramelizing time. Oops. So I did want to talk about the cocktail a little bit just because I had a few questions on it. I know I was like a little bit vague about exactly what you might need to have on hand um, only because I wanted to make it versatile, but um, basically you know, any kind of a fruit juice. So what I'm gonna be using is I have some blood orange juice I juiced a while ago and froze, so I'm excited for mine. Um, I'm using gin, vodka's good. Um, and then as far as like a syrup, you know, if you happen to have like a simple syrup, even some of those different um, like coffee flavoring syrups and stuff, if you have like a vanilla one or a, even a, you know, almond one or something like that. Um, or you could use agave or, um, you know, we can use just like a little pinch of sugar and try and shake it into the cocktail also and that will work. Um, and then we will use a little citrus and an egg white. So if you've never done an egg white cocktail, um, they're delicious and they're a lot easier than they seem like they would be. So real quick over here, I'm going to use kind of a bigger pan just to give a little bit more surface area for these guys and we'll go ahead and get a about two tablespoons of oil in there we can also go ahead and preheat our ovens to 375 because we will have a few things kind of coming in and out of the oven here in a little bit so if you want to go ahead and do that i'm going to get my heat on and I'm going to start it at medium but we'll go down to kind of like a medium low here in a minute or two. Alright, we don't need this. While I'm waiting for my pan to heat up, we'll go ahead and also chop an onion. So we're going to use that for our bruschetta and also for that chopping that we're doing. Keep up. Hi. I'm cooking. Okay, and so for chopping the onion, I'll show you guys. What you wanna do is kinda of trim off the top, but leave that root end on. We'll use that to help keep it intact as we go. Yeah, the house is gonna smell real good. <laughs> the baby bombs, yes. There will be plenty of those. <laughs> All right, so we'll peel it, but leave that root end on. And again, we will do a whole onion um, chopped up as well. So what I do when I chop up the onion is I kind of get that root end to the left of me. I use the palm of my hand to just secure it, but you can use your fingertips. If you do though, make sure that you really pinch your fingertips together and press down nice and hard so you can really see where they are because we're doing some horizontal cuts. 
Um, if you feel comfortable just using the palm of your hand, that's what I would suggest. And for this size onion, I'm gonna go up about a third of the way and then again up the next third of the way. And what I'll do is just go all the way to the end, but not through. And again, so we kind of have like three pieces, but they're all connected. And then we turn that root end away, use the tip of your knife so that you can still keep that all together and just slice along the ribs. We're gonna go about a quarter inch apart from each slice. That way we have like a nice small dice. When you're done with that, you will have kind of like a fan. And now all you have to do is turn it, get your claw in place and go straight across chopping. So we get a much more uniform cut doing it this way. And then also we can get to the end without chasing pieces all over our board. It's much safer that way. Oh, I got that. All right, we're gonna toss these in the pan and then we'll do the second half. So as I put them in, I'm gonna kind of break them apart and then use my spoon or spatula to really break it apart a little bit. And we'll let these get started on that medium heat, like I said, but just in a few minutes, we'll turn that down, add a little bit of salt and let that go. I'm gonna grab a little bowl for my onion. Yes, this is the second onion that we're chopping up now. Okay, so I'm gonna move this out of the way so you guys can see it again as you're going. Whoops. This one's actually a little bit smaller, so I'm just gonna go once. So probably what you're finding maybe too is that your knife might need to be sharpened. Um, mine, to my liking, it needs to be sharpened because I usually sharpen it about once a month. Um, but I obviously haven't. <laughs> since I've been home, so, um, you know, mine could use a lot of the time when you start kind of doing some of those horizontal cuts and things like that, you might find that yours really does need to be sharpened. So be really careful, don't force anything. If it's, um, if it's a real struggle to get through, you know, maybe move your knife and see if a different part of it is a little bit sharper. Sometimes the, the tip of it is a little bit sharper just because this is what we use the most. But if it's, if you're forcing it all, just stop and do it a different way because it's not safe to force it. Um, the, the general rule is you should be able to hold up a piece of paper and cut through it with your knife. So most people probably need to have them sharpened. Okay. We're just gonna kind of keep setting these things aside so that we get enough ready to start our chutney. I'm gonna, Move these around. I'm gonna throw about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt in and turn it down to medium low. The salt is obviously for flavor, but it also helps to kind of draw out the moisture, which aids in the caramelization. All right, so on my gas range, that's a number three. You kind of want to gauge it that way too. And then we're going to get our apple or pear, whichever it is that you have. And I'm going to peel mine. I always just use my paring knife, but if you guys still have your peeler out, you can use that. Um, you don't have to peel it if you kind of like having a little added texture, but I prefer it to be a little bit less abrasive and fibrous. Um, I am not going to add any dried fruit to mine. I actually kind of prefer not to have any dried fruit. Um, it's, it's really traditional to have dried fruit, whether it's like golden raisins, raisins, dried apricots, things like that. Um, if you have, you know, some cranberries, I actually do love a little bit of cranberry with an apple. Um, it adds an, a different element of sweetness just because it's that like candied dried. I'm just gonna do the fresh fruit. Like I said, you can throw in some if you have it. It's kind of actually a nice thing to do when you have like 
got like two teaspoons left of dried cherries in your pantry or something like that, you can use it up. I'm gonna give this a stir. <laughs> my, my cameraman. So we're getting a little color, but a lot of that's from heat versus time. So I'm even gonna turn mine down a little bit more. We don't want to just evaporate all the liquid and you know char our onions. We, we really want to draw out all the sugars, which is what the caramelization process is. And that's why we wanna really kinda keep it low, low and slow. So we'll let that keep going. I'm gonna come over and chop up my apple. Um, what I'm gonna do is instead of cutting right around the core, I'm gonna like an initial slice first because I basically want them to be about that thick and that's kind of the easiest and safest way to do that versus cutting one big piece and trying to lop that in half. So let's go ahead and just some kind of thin slices off of our apple or pear for something like this. Um, at work a lot of the time I'll look at you know, our fruit and our herbs and things and catch something that's maybe about to go bad. You know, if you have one of if you have a really bruised apple or kind of a pear that's kind of ready to go or you have like a little bit of dried fruit or some herbs that might go bad soon, you can kind of put it all together and it's such a small dish but it packs so much flavor that it's worth, you know, having on your appetizer trays and everything. All right, so from here we're going to do just a small dice and I will show you what I mean kind of going for like about that big. Um, you know, you want it about this big so that it doesn't take forever to cook down, but also you want to think about if I'm taking a little spoonful of something to put on top of a cracker with cheese, I wouldn't want some big chunk of apple. So that's kind of a good way to think about it too. All right, it is taking a little bit longer to get to the cocktail time than I thought but a couple more minutes. We'll just get our chutney going and then we'll make it. I know I'm ready for a little refreshment. What kinds of uh, cocktails have you guys been making? Have you been trying to make like new ones that you haven't tried before or? I feel like we're either going like fancy cocktail or boxed wine. <laughs> it's kind of the perfect combination really. Try and kind of line them up. Everything, yes, I agree. Um, it does seem like kind of a time to maybe master that Manhattan or something. Wine, yes. <laughs> Brent has decided he really likes champagne, so it's been kind of fun to share that sometimes, but then sometimes it's kind of sad because he drinks my champagne. <laughs> As we go along, um, I know I put out like a bunch of different options for different ingredients, so if you're using something different than I am and you have a question about it, um, just let me know. A lot of the time I'll add a berry or two to this if they're kind of going bad. And I know it sounds funny, a berry or two, but if it's like a big strawberry, that's enough. <laughs> um, you really can add anything. So I'm going to use that same little saucepan again. I'm going to throw a little bit of olive oil in there to get started. And we've got, you know, our garlic onion here. I'm basically going to take, it'll be like a little handful of onion. So I'm gonna heat up my oil first. And then as that's heating up, we're gonna also get our ginger ready. Um, you know, I know that everybody doesn't have fresh ginger on hand. If you do though, it really makes a big difference in something like that. You'll find that it um, becomes a like big part of the flavor profile. So with ginger, uh, <laughs> again, I will usually peel with my paring knife if it's nice and fresh though, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like the videos where you can use, which mine is nice and fresh, I'm going to bring it up a little bit. 
You can actually use the side of a spoon and it'll peel it and you won't lose a lot of your ginger. But a lot of the time what I'll do is peel it with my paring knife, wash and then I'll throw those peels into like a cup of tea and it's awesome to have a little fresh ginger. Oh, I just put some olive oil in the pan. That's all so far. How much? I, I have one whole apple that I chopped up. Really small one. You might want to do two. Um, but yeah, it's just one apple. So I'm going to get this peeled, but I'm going to throw in my onion and let that start. So a lot of recipes will say to put in your onion and your garlic and things like that all at the same time, but we can see how different in size that is. I always start with just onions. So like I said, like a small handful, quarter of a cup probably. Let that get started and we'll chop up our ginger the same way we did our garlic basically. A lot of the time when I do garlic and ginger, I'll actually just use my paring knife because I feel like I can maybe be, you know, a little bit more precise. We'll do some little strips and then chop it up. Mine is like really fresh and it's just falling apart and it's awesome. Okay, so give this a little stir. While we're over here, we'll kind of stir our onions. If you're doing the onions, you can probably, as you're moving it, they're like losing their structure down that's awesome I am gonna turn it up a tiny bit to like number three on my stove and then give this stir and we don't need to go crazy with like caramelizing these onions because it's gonna be cooked so long and slow on the heat that we can kind of go with it so I'm gonna just toss butter in now I'm gonna toss a little bit of garlic in, probably about a teaspoon or like a clove and a half from what we had chopped up. And then I'm also going to put this on the heat again and add a little bit of fresh thyme or dried thyme. Um, you can add rosemary, you can add any kind of a dried seasoning like that. We wanna get a little bit of aromatics. If you do have fresh thyme, all you have to do is just kind of run your finger down the stalk to remove it. And whoops, um, throwing it in while it's still on direct heat helps to really open it up, especially something like rosemary or thyme that's a little bit more woody than a lot of the other fresh herbs that we use. So I'm gonna put in you know, about a teaspoon and let that go in there too. So Brent's gonna kind of keep it on here and I'll keep telling you guys what, what to add in. Um, we are gonna be using a little bit of cayenne pepper a little bit of cinnamon if you have it, so just so that you have it all kind of ready. Some questions. This is all going into the other saucepan. So Kim Porter, the caramelized onion is staying on its own right now. And then so far we have just the onions, garlic, and ginger, and thyme in the pan. We're about to put our apple in. Okay, so here comes the apple. And with the apple, before everything starts to burn, um, I'm going to add a tablespoon of water. It's going to kind of react and jump a little bit, but I want to give it something to work with. So we'll put in about a tablespoon of water. I'm going to give it a stir. I love that sound. Here's the gel. I'm also going to put in a tablespoon of brown sugar. Say hi. If you don't have brown sugar, you can use honey. If you don't have honey, you can use regular sugar. Just kind of anything to add a little bit of sweetness. I like brown sugar just because it has a little bit more depth with the molasses in it and everything. And that sugar is going to melt down and kind of become a little bit of a cooking liquid also. Pretty soon though, as our apples start to cook down, we won't have to worry about it at all. It already smells so good. All right. Hi, Laura. Okay, 
Okay, so we're going to add about a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a little, probably like a quarter teaspoon of salt, and a sprinkle of cayenne pepper. Hey, Laura. I like to use cayenne pepper versus black pepper, just again, it's a different flavor profile. I think I'm like not finding things in my kitchen as easily right now because it's organized and I'm just not used to that. <laughs> okay, so we'll give this a stir. I have it on medium heat right now, which will keep it on medium for a few minutes, kind of let that liquid boil. And then I'm gonna put the lid on, turn it to low, and let the steam kinda cook all of it. So we'll let that go just a couple minutes. We don't wanna let it boil long enough that our liquid disappears. So pretty soon we'll put that lid back on. And I think it's time to make a cocktail. What do you guys think? I'm gonna go put my lid on, turn it down to low, and we're gonna shake up a cocktail. Okay, so I'm gonna wash my hands because I don't really want garlic in my cocktail. Okay, right, so I have, let me see, I just need one egg. I'm making Brent's gonna get one of these too, so this is enough to make two cocktails. I gotta get an egg out. All right, so for separating our eggs, usually we wanna just find a spot we can kinda crack. And I always like to use just the egg for separating. And just go back and forth. Ew. I actually got a pretty gross egg. I'm gonna get a different one. <laughs> Especially for something like this. I'm not interested in that. So I'm gonna get a new bowl, new egg. Try that again. Um, some people prefer to use like the pasteurized egg whites that come in a container. I'm not really as concerned about how many eggs. What's in the egg as what's on the egg, so I usually will even wash it off. We're just gonna do, so for two cocktails, you just need one egg white. So, and I don't wanna crack down my board because sometimes some of it comes out. And just kind of find that weak, always use your hand instead. Kind of remove it, wash your hands. All right, and I'm gonna grab my little shaker. Got a question. So, Molly, I use my yolks usually for lemon curd, or um, you know, you can make curd out of really any juice. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, but yeah, no, I usually will kind of save my yolks and use them for lemon curd. There's certain like bread recipes and stuff that I used to make more often that would call for more egg yolks than egg, the whole eggs, so sometimes I'd save them. You can freeze them, you know, especially if you're doing something like macarons or maybe you're making 10 of these cocktails instead of two. Um, you can save them all into a container and freeze them for when you're ready to use them. Give this a little stir. I also, I'm not like the biggest fan of you know, eggs for breakfast and things like that, but there is a really cool um, project that I'm gonna try, like salt curing egg yolks. So I'll have to do that and put a video up. But basically, you can cure just a raw egg yolk in a bunch of salt, and after, I think it's just like four days, and you do it in the fridge, it's not like a fermentation on the countertop or anything, um, but after like four or five days, you rinse off the salt and you can actually like slice it and put it on top of things. It's kind of cool. All right, fancy little thing of gin. Um, I love my little makeshift Grateful Dead uh, shaker here, but 
at some point I'm gonna have to get an adult shaker because it starts to like spew out the sides sometimes. Um, all right, so I kind of use a shot glass to help me measure what I'm adding in. This is my rosemary grapefruit syrup that my mom gave me. Like I said, you can use you know any kind of simple syrup or agave or something like that. Or alternatively, you can throw a tablespoon of sugar into this and we'll try and shake it in. I'm putting about a half an ounce. Um, basically, a shot glass is an ounce. So we'll pour that in. And then my blood orange juice kind of separated, so I'm going to shake it. We're going to put in three and a half ounces of juice. And a half. And then we are going to juice some lemon. So basically half of a lemon juiced. So I'm going to come over to my board so I can chop it in half. And then we'll just juice that right into the cocktail shaker. Yes, it does sound awesome. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of like a general recipe. Like I said, you can use any kind of juice. You could use lime instead if that's what you have. Um, and then a lot of the time when I try something like this, I'll find that you know, I don't like things as sweet as other people. I might like a little extra citrus, a little less syrup, that sort of thing. So adjust it to your taste. Um, and then we just toss our little egg white on top of here. And what we're going to do, and I always do cover mine with a towel as I shake, but what we're going to do is shake it for like 30 seconds pretty quickly, and then we're going to add ice cubes into it and shake it again for a little while because the um, that's what we kind of need for our little froth to come out perfect. This isn't exactly a fizz. Um, if you wanted to do a fizz, then you would put it in a larger glass and then top it with you know some soda water or something. And if you guys are cooking, please post your pictures. I want to see what you made and what your drinks look like. I have um, like a little bit of fresh rosemary to garnish the top of my egg white with. Okay, that should be good. I'm going to put two or three ice cubes in, and then that's when you want to go really pretty vigorously. Excuse me. Okay. Do you have any questions? Oop. Take a second to recognize our son's artwork here. <laughs> Bam. All right. I'm going to do this over the sink. Vigorous. It's worth it. because the foam that we're creating really starts to kind of push on your lid. Probably could have mentioned that before, right? Okay. Nice. So, yay! I have my fanciest glass in all the land. I'm gonna pour half of it into here. Oops, why did I do that? I forgot. My little ice cubes, I should have used the top. Okay, so I'm gonna let that settle. Put my lid back on so I can strain off the ice. Here we go. Much easier. Top this one off a little. Kind of the last that's coming out is the last of that egg foam for this one. And we'll do little garnish. And the other thing that looks really pretty on top of these, I think, which is a fun little surprise at the bottom of your glass, but like a little peppercorn. Oh my. 
my gosh. Look at her. Oh, yeah, one's for Brent. Which one, though? This one. Cheers! If you've never gotten blood oranges, get them. They're amazing. Okay. So real quick before we start our next little project, I'm going to lift the lid on this, give it a stir. It's looking great. We'll turn it up again just a tiny bit. You can see you're kind of getting a little bit of a syrup down there. So. It smells wicked. Yeah, it's so good. Between your fruit and that little bit of sugar, I mean, we're kind of sweetening up the onions and everything in this too. So you can see why at the end you'd want to throw in, you know, a little bit of vinegar to kind of brighten it up, a little bit of mustard. Our caramelized onions are looking so good. What we're going to do is get our bruschetta into the oven. tomatoes and then that way I'm also kind of showing you guys the alternative way um, but a lot of the time like this bruschetta that I kind of came up with it's not a fresh one it's a baked and roasted one so it's again a lot of like caramelization I obviously like caramelization um, but basically you know I kind of tend to look at that container of cherry or grape tomatoes that maybe I didn't quite get to and I don't want them to go bad so I'll quick slice them in half and you know toss them together with some things and roast them so that they don't get wasted. All right. So I'm going to use the can. What kind of drink did you make Tina? I want to know what everybody had on hand and what they did with it. I know um, Jeanette said she had orange juice so I told her she should add a little vanilla to kind of make it like a creamsicle flavor. Um, all sorts of fun stuff. Okay. I'm going to do something that I don't usually do, which is put some tomatoes into a metal bowl, but they're only going to be in there for a minute, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, canned tomatoes, we definitely want to strain them really well. So I have this guy all ready to go. Um, if you are chopping up tomatoes, if you have grape tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, whoa, I'd say just in half. If they're really big, you can do quarters. I'm not doing all of this either. Um, for this though, the can, we want to get off like any excess liquid we can. You'll be surprised how much you can get off of there. Okay. Ooh, yum. Fresh squeezed orange juice, white grape and gin, watermelon with lime. Holy cow. Well, soon enough we'll be able to share those cocktails together. Okay, I'm like actually even pressing this a little bit to get You'd think it would take longer to chop fresh tomatoes, but it might take just as long to strain canned tomatoes. All right, and then this is going to be super easy because we already chopped our onion and our garlic for this. So throw that in there. What I'm going to do is quick dump my liquid that in. We're going to use, I think we're using all the rest of this. Let me just make sure. Yeah, so all the rest of your onions going right into there. I think, I think we're going to use all the rest of our garlic too. Yes. So. All the rest of our garlic. Now we need some olive oil, salt, and pepper. And it's all over here. Perfect. <laughs> all right. So I got my little bowl of goodies. Um, you know, you may prefer totally different proportions. I mean, I am heavy on garlic and onion versus like tons and tons of tomatoes because that's just what I love. So you do what you like. 
little black pepper scratched onto there. Um, this can go right into like a Pyrex, you know, um, glass container or onto a sheet tray with parchment paper. Um, I have a sheet tray with parchment ready, but honestly, it's almost a little more messy that way. All right. Stir it all together, get it into our 375 oven in whatever container you got. Looks good. All right, I'm gonna grab my pan. My kitchen has no counter space. Well, it does, but I just use it up immediately. <laughs> I have a bigger pan than I totally need, but basically getting into a kind of like thin, even layer. And I'm gonna leave a little spot because if you guys happen to have another whole bulb of garlic, I'm gonna just show you real quick how to roast some garlic, which is really nice on the side of a little cheese tray too. Now obviously if you guys have other you know, cheeses on hand, like hard cheeses and stuff that you wanna throw into the tray, that's nice. Um, a little thing of jam is always nice. All right, I'm gonna just set this right here on my sink and show you guys the roasted garlic. Alright, so we've got our whole bulb right here, and I'm just going to trim the top of it off. Did you add salt? Yes, salt that mixture for sure. Alright, so I just kind of cut off the top so that as many of the cloves are exposed without wasting a bunch of the garlic. Take a nice little piece of foil, throw on some olive oil about a tablespoon and a half, and then a generous pinch of salt on that. Kind of do it right onto the garlic. And pepper. And we just kind of want to create like a little steam oven for it. So we just really seal it all up. And we'll set that just on the side of our pan. This is ready to go in, 375. Caramelized onions are definitely caramelizing. Check on our here. Looks amazing. At the end, sometimes depending on um, the fruit that you use and how much liquid it lets out, um, sometimes it's getting like a little bit dry and you need to add a little liquid. Um, you can do water again, or what I do a lot of the time is like I have a little red wine there. I'll toss a little red wine in or whatever kind of wine you might add. That's always good. Let's see. We're going to make our breadsticks. So I made these yesterday just to kind of, I do a lot of things where I don't use a real recipe and I change it every time I do it. So I wanted to get a real recipe for you guys um, and just kind of test time. Thing. And what I found was it was really good with a little curry powder. So if you have some curry powder to add. And then the other thing I did was I had kind of some fun with um, rolling them out and making them into like the grassini, which is the unleavened Italian breadsticks that are kind of crunchy. But I also rolled some out a little more thin here <laughs> and um, used a little round cookie cutter and made some actual crackers. And the thing that was perfect was I was able to put them all on the pan. And even though they're different sizes, I wanted one to get crispier than the other. So it kind of came out nice. I'm gonna get to the bowl. The avalanche of my cabinets. All right, I'm just gonna pull up this little recipe that I had written down yesterday. Um, so also with this, like something that can be kind of nice is to double the recipe and then split your dough. And before you add turmeric or curry in. Um, have half of it where maybe you add some Parmesan cheese and some chopped up rosemary and get that nice, you know, bread looking cracker color and then do the other half a bright color and kind of, you know, you can roll it out and cut triangles out of the rosemary and breadsticks out of the turmeric so you have different colors on your tray and stuff. 
Oh, I already had a bowl. Look at me. I'm not used to this organization. All right. Um, so to this bowl, I have one cup of flour. So let you guys get that. So into the flour, half a teaspoon of baking powder. I have this powdered turmeric and I'm gonna add a whole teaspoon to get that awesome color that we're looking for. If you have some curry powder, that was really tasty, so I'll add a half a teaspoon of that. And then we're going to use a half a teaspoon of salt. And if you have onion powder or garlic powder, we'll add, oops, sorry. How much? What are we doing? We'll add like a teaspoon of it. I noticed that mine was a little bit, um, a little bit bland with only a half a teaspoon. So we'll add a teaspoon of that. So it is one cup of flour, half a teaspoon of baking powder. We've got a teaspoon of our turmeric, teaspoon of our onion or garlic powder, half a teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of curry if you have it. But yeah, half a teaspoon of baking powder. And then we're gonna get a liquid measure. And we'll just kind of give it a quick, quick stir. We don't want clumps of spices, but more than anything, we don't want a clump of baking powder. That's cool. Okay. Turn mine off. I'm liking the color I have, so you guys kind of gauge it, see what you like. I'm gonna do. About a tablespoon and a half of oil, and then three tablespoons of warm water. Let's just kind of let it run for a second until it's warmer. Um, we will want a sheet tray with some parchment on it for this, and these bake really quickly. So. Questions? We're doing good? Before the turmeric, curry, and onion and garlic powder. Make sure. Yeah, and right after the one cup of flour was half a teaspoon of baking powder. This is probably hot now. Alright, so three tablespoons, which I have a measure on there, of warm water. And I'm going to start off with a spoon, but I ended up kneading it with my hands. And it really, like I said, difference to kind of have it warm just because it wants to kind of absorb it really quick. So the water, oh shoot, it's going in and out. I'm so sorry. Okay, so the water is um, three tablespoons. Oil is a tablespoon and a half. We said it was kind of going in and out. Okay, so it's kind of scrappy. I'm going to use my hands to bring the rest of it together. And even though the color isn't really once all of the flour is incorporated, and once we kind of start to roll this out on our tray, you'll see that that color becomes really nice and vibrant. Of course, it does kind of depend on the brand of turmeric and everything that you have. Um, what I usually will do is when I'm cutting all sorts of things, which none of this would really be an issue with our breadsticks, but I'm going to just flip my board over to roll anything out. Mine isn't real sticky, but it does have kind of a Play-Doh effect to it. That's perfect. So if yours is pretty sticky, you can always add a little bit more flour. You know, if it's dry, which I don't think it will be, you could always add a little bit more warm water, but um, kind of going for that Play-Doh consistency. All right, and I'm gonna flip my board. Good. This is where the Wi-Fi is, it loses. 
And I have a little extra flour ready for rolling. We don't want to stick. So we'll spread a little bit of flour onto the tray. You'll want to grab out a rolling pin. Um, I also grabbed out a pizza cutter. It's quick and easy for kind of rolling those breadsticks. So let's see, where's my rolling pin? Allie, where it belongs. All right. So I'm going to kind of coat it with some flour, turn it over again, and do the same. And we're going to roll it out. Sorry, I'm going to move that. So for the breadsticks, we want it to be like a of an inch thick, not too, too thick, um, but we want to be able to have it be a little bit chewy. Let me see. Before the warm water was a tablespoon and a half of olive oil. Okay. So I just kind of keep flipping it so that it doesn't stick at all. Now, it's up to you. Obviously, some of us you know, kind of don't mind something a little bit more rustic. Some of us want things really uniformed. If you want your breadsticks to be really uniformed, you can just trim your edges, kind of create a rectangle, and then cut your pieces. I kind of like that some of them are rustic, so I'll just start cutting along the edge. I like them about that thick, about half an inch. And you can twist some of them and press them onto your tray like that leave some of them plain. Um, you, know, you could always top them with like poppy seeds or sesame seeds or anything like that. Does not matter what the size is, it's whatever you kind of like. Um, these are again kind of to add height and color. And just that we can create some of this stuff on our own at home, especially during a time like this where we can't always get those extra ingredients. So I'm going to do about that many of them as breadsticks, and I'm going to roll the rest out to do little crackers. I need to get that trimmed, you, Brent. No, no, no. Behind you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sheet tray with parchment. And these get a little bit of a rise, but not much, so you don't have to worry about spacing them out too much or anything like that. I'm going to twist a few, throw them on. I kind of liked the ones, the look of the twisted ones more, but we'll do a couple of each. And like I said, just kind of leave a little spot for some um, crackers rolled out too. So with that little extra dough that I have, I'm going to roll it even thinner than it is. So I'm going to just kind of ball it back up. Roll it out real thin. So I'm going for like a quarter of an inch this time to get a nice crispy cracker. That should be perfect. I have this cute little cutter to use. Um, and you can kind of keep rolling all your scraps and get a bunch. There's plenty. It's amazing how much comes from just a cup of flour. All right, I'll save that for later. Throw my little crackers in. And then these will go in right with your bruschetta. 375 is good. Um, I am going to set the timer on this because it matters a little bit more than the bruschetta. So I think I found like 14 minutes is the perfect amount. So we'll start there. Okay, very good. All right, so we'll get some of this stuff out of the way. Don't need any more. I'm gonna use my bench scraper and just kind of scrape my flour into the sink. We have one more little thing of chopping to do for our little herbed cheese. Um, I am actually going to hold off on that one more minute, and we will come and finish our chutney. So if you want to go ahead and get your mustard, a little bit of vinegar, 
maybe a little bit of wine if you want. We are ready for that. Um, I've been brewing my own vinegars in the basement, and so I have like all these really good ones that I've been doing. I have an apple cider, tons of apple cider vinegar. Um, I have one of my favorites is a ginger apple cider one. I did a pineapple. This one is like my favorite. Um, it's Concord grape juice with balsamic that I made. And it's not just infused, it's actually like brewed with the mother that I created in my little lab and I love it. It's exciting. Okay, so um, at this point we can actually kind of pull this off of the heat to finish up so I can show you a little bit better. And it really doesn't need to be cooked that much more at this point. So what we're going to do, we'll add about a tablespoon of vinegar, whatever your choice is. A sherry vinegar is really nice in something like this. And then about a half a teaspoon of a Dijon mustard. Maybe a teaspoon. Okay. I have plenty of liquid in mine. Sometimes, depending on exactly what temperature you have it cooking on, you know, you might be evaporating more and need something like a little bit of wine. If you just added some of the similar things that I just did, you're smelling something really good. And you can tell that it's kind of like a really strong flavor. So I have enough liquid in mine that I'm gonna actually put it on the heat for like 30 more seconds, just right on, totally on. Just evaporate a little bit of that. Um, as it cools, it will kind of thicken up on its own also. So what we'll do is as soon as this like 30 second, you know, high heat thing is up, we'll put it into our little pretty container for the tray and just let it kind of cool right next to our pickles that are hanging out. All right, so I have this guy on it. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly some of that liquid evaporates. Go ahead, turn that off, and I'm going to pour it into here. And then just set it aside to cool. So you wouldn't want to put this straight into your fridge to cool just because when you put something hot in the fridge, it can kind of encourage bacteria growth. If, you know, you're getting really, really close to serving time and you wanted it to be much more cool, you could put it into um, like a little metal bowl and set it over an ice bath and just kind of stir it back and forth and it'll cool really quickly for you too. I think it's just time for a sip here real quick. <sighs> it's delicious. I'll put this out of the way. Okay, and then the last thing that we have to get ready and prep is our cheese. So I'm using goat cheese, um, and before adding anything into it, the easiest thing to do is kind of mash it all up. So if you have ricotta, that's great. If you have... Um, Cream cheese, that's perfect. You want to just kind of really mash it up in your bowl so that you can stir everything together. So I have, for my herbs, I have some of the fresh thyme. I have some parsley. I am going to put in some lemon zest, a little salt and pepper. I just remembered we were going to use some garlic for this. But instead of garlic, I'm going to chop up a ramp and throw that in. Um, it doesn't need garlic. You could always add a little bit of garlic powder or something like that, too, if you want. Um, we don't have a microwave. <laughs> if you do have a microwave and you need to soften your cheese a little bit quicker, just like five seconds at a time in there is good. All right, and then, you know, what we're kind of going for, if you've ever had, like, borsan, you know, like that soft cheese with lots of herbs and flavoring, it's kind of along the lines of what we're going for here. Thank you, I like the rooster apron too. <laughs> All right. Oh, I do have some basil too. I'm gonna add some basil in. So this is um, going to get the caramelized onions on the top of it once we're ready to plate it up. And if you haven't turned off your caramelized onions, you probably wanna do that. Because the other thing is, is we want it to cool. So actually, what we can do real quick before we move forward is even just get our onions into a bowl so they start cooling. Obviously, we don't want them to melt our cheese or anything, so get them off of the stove. 
tools and get them into here. They look really pretty. Mine got a little bit crispier because I wasn't paying attention. It's fine, but usually a really good caramelized, caramelized onion is really soft. Okay. So we'll set that aside to cool. And I'm just going to add a ton of fresh thyme because I love it. It's my favorite. I did find that um, Joseph will stand on his stool and just take the leaves off of the stalk for me for a while, which is pretty awesome. Okay, um, we're going to add fresh parsley if we have it. Um, if you have any kind of like a leafy herb, we basically want to take all of the leaves from the stalks. And then we'll get them into a pile and we'll do that rack and chop where we kind of stabilize the knife and go in a quarter turn. I want to live with a chef. <laughs> Come on over, live with us. All right, so we don't need too, too much parsley. I'm going to do about that much will be good. All right, so yeah, get it in kind of a little pile and just chop back and forth. You may have to kind of gather it in the middle again. I haven't had a chance to go out and forage for, not had a chance, I just haven't done it yet. <laughs> go out and forage for ramps yet. Um, this is like the perfect, perfect timing calendar wise to do it. But my sister Katie got me some and my buddy Andy got me some. I have like, instead of vases of flowers, I have vases of ramps. So ramps, if you've never used them before, um, it's a wild onion, wild garlic. Um, I think I have it so packed I can barely get it out. You, when you forage for them, you only want to take some of the bulbs. The bulbs, you know, these don't like continue to produce and produce on their own. So you want to leave a lot of those bulbs, otherwise they won't grow back, obviously. So you can go right up to the top of the bulb, and then it'll still come back next year. Um, and all of this is usable. I'm going to do a couple videos on some different things that we can use them for, but it's a great um, sub for some garlic. So I'm not going to really put much of the leaf into this just because of the texture, but I'm going to wash the bottom of this and use it kind of in place of garlic. You do not need to chop another clove of garlic if you don't feel like it. Um, if you want to, you can, and it'll be good in that cheese. But I'm just gonna kind of cut it up to that same, like, minced size as my garlic was. And then if you have a microplane or a zester for your lemon, you wanna grab that out, because we will zest a lemon into this too. Any questions? <laughs> Slow down and get to the end. Okay. So, parsley and garlic going in. I'm going to add my little bit of basil. If you have some basil and you want to add it in, that's great. I'll show you guys how to do what's called a chiffonade to chop it up. Mine's already wilting. Um, basically, to cut the basil, you want to kind of take your larger leaves, set them on the bottom, and just keep stacking. So Kim, I set my timer. Hey, I set my timer for 14 minutes for the um, breadsticks to start, and then we'll kind of check on them. Hey Joe, you're gonna knock it over. Ah! Oh man! All right, let go. <laughs> okay, so I have them all rolled up, and then I'm just gonna basically thin slice like little ribbons, kind of. Hey, Brent. Just pulling everything down. All right. This is looking good. Let's hit it with some salt and pepper and lemon zest. Looks like we got just a couple more minutes on our cracker. Joseph didn't like the cords where they were. Probably just like a quarter teaspoon of salt to start because, you know, depending on what kind of cheese you're using, it may already have a little bit of salt in it and you'll want to do it. 
I'm gonna grab my lemon. Um, when you're zesting, you always want to wash the citrus so that you don't have any pesticides or anything yuck. And then I have this microplane that makes it much easier, but if you have um, even just a box grater, has like a zesting side to it. And basically for this, I just rest it on the bowl and you want to just do one swipe and then turn it. So that way you don't end up getting any of that bitter white pith. You just get the um, good oil from the actual zest. So I'm going to zest the entire lemon into here. Um, the citrus brightens it so much and it's delicious. And usually this is like, I would never do this. I know I juiced my lemon into my cocktail. I never will just use the juice from um, citrus. A little tip I have, one second, is I will, if, I'm, if I only need the juice, I will zest my lemon into a container and I keep it in the freezer and then anytime I need it, I have it on hand. Most things though, when you're cooking, if, if it tastes good with lemon juice in it, it's going to benefit from having the zest. I didn't want lemon zest in a cocktail, but most things when you're cooking, you may as well add that in. <laughs> All right, let's see. 3038. Thank you. Okay, so I have all these yummy things in here. I'm going to stir it up a little, but I am really quick before we do that. Let's check on our breadsticks slash crackers slash bruschetta, all that good stuff. Um, our bruschetta can stay in there for quite a while. Sometimes I'll let it go for like an hour, depending on the size, because it'll just start to caramelize all the sugars in the tomato. Um, sometimes I'll crank up the heat and have it at like 450 just so it gets some char on it. Um, you could always use like fire roasted tomatoes if you're going to use a can, um, which will already start off with some flavor kind of in it. Um, but like I said, most of the time when I do it, it's really just to kind of use up some of those tomatoes before they go bad. Um, you know, and obviously once our tomatoes start getting ripe in August and everything, we're trying to come up with different ways to use them all up and, um, this is something that can then go in the fridge and stay in the fridge for a little while. All right, so we're on our crackers. Oh my gosh, they look so good. I'm gonna let them go. I'm gonna set the timer like three more minutes just so that the crackers crisp up a little bit more. And we'll go ahead and stir this all together. Yes. Okay. Let's grab out your spoon or your fork. My Cheese is kind of hard to work with and mash in, so I'll probably end up switching to a fork. I actually, a lot of the time, will end up, I like using like a mixture of cream cheese and goat cheese just because it kind of lightens up that muskiness of goat cheese, and it also, because it's cream cheese, it is a little bit more creamy and easier to work with. Um, because a lot of the time, what I like to do is kind of shape it on my tray, almost like a little, like, borson type you know, round cheese, um, and it makes it so much easier with a little bit of cream cheese in it. Or ricotta. If you're working with ricotta, which is going to be a lot more thin, sometimes a good thing to do is actually strain it a little bit. Um, but if not, you know, just stir everything in, and this will be like a pretty little rustic cheese ball on your tray. Yeah, it's time to maybe, maybe switch to a fork. I don't know. We'll get through it. That looks good. I am going to, and I suggest you do too, take like three minutes and like clear your area because we want to start building our little cheese board now. So I'm going to dump my garbage bowl and get that out of the way. Kind of going to leave around my salt and peppers and things like that, but just kind of get stuff out of your flow. Something like a half of a lemon, we want to put that on the tray and make it pretty. If you have an orange, you can cut that in half, and it does so much. If you happen to have some parsley that's looking fresh, you know, throwing a few sprigs onto your, onto your tray. And I know it seems silly when we're home in quarantine to be garnishing, but pretty things taste better, okay? And we deserve it. I mean, if you made the cocktail that I made, then you know that pretty things taste better. So get rid of all of this. 
got about a minute left on our timer. And let's see. Oh my gosh, Kim, yes, we're making the crostini. I forgot. No worries, they'll only take a couple minutes. Well, I'll just get that now. I'll get a clipboard. I totally forgot. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> All right, so Christini, if you have a baguette that you've gotten ready for this, it'll take us just a minute to prep this, and we'll just throw it in at the end of all the cooking here in the oven. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Grace used half of ours the other day, so we had half of one. So you'll want to grab out a serrated knife, um, whether it's a bread knife or just like a big carving knife. That's and we're going to go for about that thickness. All right, so let's grab out our breadsticks if you put them in at the same time as me. Um, and the crackers may still seem kind of soft, but they'll actually crisp up a little bit more as they cool. There we go. So we'll let those start to cool. I'm going to go ahead and pull my bruschetta also because I don't really want to serve like hot bruschetta. I want this to cool a little bit as well. You should be able to just stack your trays. I'm going to throw my garlic in though because it probably needs about 10 more minutes and we'll let it go while we do our crostini. I have this, whoops, this little sheet tray ready for our crostini. I wait to say, ooh, that sounds good. All right, so yeah, you want to keep going about that thick and then we'll just kind of arrange them. You can really kind of cram them together too, it doesn't matter. We're just going to toss a little olive oil and a little salt and pepper on. And I would probably crank up my oven to 400. And we'll let these go until we're ready to, ready to serve. Alright. Not the garbage bowl anymore. It's not the first time that Kim has had to remind me of something that I might have forgotten to do in the kitchen. <laughs> we'll be doing cooking classes and they'll say, wait, didn't you have dessert in the freezer we're supposed to serve? It's like, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, that was perfect. Half a baguette fits my little tiny pan perfectly. So yeah, drizzle, a little olive oil over all of them, a little salt and pepper. We'll toss them in, crank up the heat. You don't have to crank up the heat if you don't want to, but it'll help it along. As soon as I do this, I'm going to actually get my um, bruschetta into another bowl too, just so it starts to cool a little bit. And obviously that's from what I made, at least, depending on how much you made. A decent amount, so I'll put up just like one little bowl of it onto the tray and kind of set the rest aside. To get this in. Okay, so I set the timer for 10 minutes, but we'll check on them. Oh, we're so close. I'm sorry. I know we're going over a little bit. Hopefully, you're not starving. All right, now that I'm really filling my sink. Very typical. I'm gonna clear the area and we'll get out our tray. So if you guys have like a nice size little cheese board or platter, you'll want to grab that. I like to either use wood or white. Um, the white kind of brings out the colors of everything that you have and so does wood. So I have a big white platter ready. Totally gonna make something that's way more than our family needs today, but it's gonna be great. All right, so I've got our little chutney. I have these nice little spoons. It's kind of nice to use a spoon versus anything else so that we're sure we can scoop it on. Um, with our cheese that we got together here, I'm actually gonna kind of shape it in the bowl. If you have um, 
like a biscuit cutter. It's awesome to do on a side plate and just set your biscuit color cover cutter. Set it onto your side plate and then kind of smash your cheese in. If you put a little olive oil on the inside of that ring and then pull it off, you kind of have an shape. But you know, the queen's not at our celebration tonight, so we'll just do this. So I'm going to kind of cut my hand and set that down. So we've got that. I'm actually going to offset it. As you're doing it, you know, you kind of want to think about what else you have that's going to be going on to the tray. So that leaves a nice spot for our bruschetta, and then we kind of build out with all of our other stuff. Okay, so our caramelized onions, we're going to go ahead and put them on the top of this. Is everybody doing all right? Okay. All right, so you might not need all of this, you know, see what looks reasonable, but having some fall down looks cool too. I mean, have it all around it. Looks beautiful. All right, I'm gonna save a little bit of mine. Um, and then if you have like a little kind of cheese spreader or something, that's perfect for that. We also have our little pickles, which, you know, my liquid is almost cool, which is great. Um, that means that you know, our carrots are pretty well pickled. And once you put a lid on this and put this in the fridge, you know, whatever's left over, they'll just continue to get flavor. So we'll kind of set that over here. If you have a little jam or something you want to put in a little cup, that always looks nice. We are going to get that bruschetta cooling while we set out the rest of it. So. I'm just going to scrape mine right into a bowl over here. So I'm hoping to kind of do more of these, you know, live stream classes too as time goes on, especially if we're at home as much as we are and if we continue to be at home this much. Um, so let me know, like, any feedback. I mean, I know, like I said, I know this was kind of ambitious to do this many dishes in one little sitting, but like I said, I figured... It's something we're celebrating, and hopefully you had enough stuff to do a couple of them. Um, but I'd love to hear what else you would like to do. Yeah, this is definitely going to be a little warm. I'm going to get a bowl, and we'll just let it cool on the tray. Um, I'm going to use a smaller one. So even just kind of choosing different types of containers to put your goodies in helps to add some, you know, some diversity. You could obviously add like a nice like sliced up cucumber or some other veggies or things like that on the tray. Like I said, if you have, you know, a hard cheese to add to the mix, nice manchego or something. We'll get another little spoon and a spreader. Let's see. Here's a good spoon for that. Oh, I have a fork. It's not a necessity, but it's nice. Okay, I got this guy too. So I'm going to move this so you guys can kind of see what we're doing. Got all of these guys going on. So there's different options with like, you know, your breadsticks and stuff. Depending on what your tray is looking like, I think that I have plenty of height. But if it was something that I was putting together where it was really, like I said, kind of all that lower region, I would maybe put these into a glass and have them splay out so it's, you know, sticking up. I think that these will look really nice kind of tucked in on the side, just giving us some length and some kind of tray. Add them all in, and we've got our crackers. Can add those along the edges. We'll obviously have our crostini to fill it all out. So, crostini is coming soon because I forgot. But in the meantime, we can add some other garnishes. So, where did that go? Like I said, we've got. You know, take take some citrus. Give it a little color by, 
you know, putting a lemon over here and a lemon over here. Get rid of any seeds that are visible. Get some of your fresh, pretty um, parsley. If you have like some kale or any kind of greens that are really pretty and fresh, throw those on. Kind of tuck these in and around. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions? Ah, yes. I will put the recipes up ahead of time next time so that way you're not kind of tripping over maybe what I'm saying. Sorry about that. All right. So this is looking very pretty. I hope you guys are getting close on yours too. Um, we have just a couple more minutes on our crostini. It's up to you how toasted you want it. Um, you know, I actually love having them really crispy for certain things and then a little bit softer for certain things. For this, I think I would want it a little softer because basically, you know, you don't want to be like serving something really, really, really crunchy to a crowd and expect them to be able to put something on it and not have it kind of fall out everywhere. So I'm going to take them out as soon as this timer goes off. So just 10 minutes, it'll have a light toast and we'll arrange it and ready to serve. So let me know if you guys have any questions. We'll just stay on for another couple minutes. And then please post pictures of your tray. Excited to see what you guys made. I'm going to pull our roasted garlic right now. You can tell when the garlic is done because of that smell, it's perfect. Um, be careful opening it up. The cloves should be kind of like popping up out of the bowl. And this is awesome, served just with the bread. Add it to your hummus, um, add it to any pasta dish, anything Italian. And a lot of the time I'll do like two or three at a time. Be careful when you're opening it too because of the steam escaping. Yeah, so um, replay, we're just going to save the video and post it onto the page so you can go back at any point and replay anything. Um, and I will also post all the recipes in the event and all that so you can go back to it. Okay, so here is my roasted garlic. It looks amazing. So it has a little bit of color. The the cloves are kind of starting to pop up. I'm going to grab something to get it out of there, though. And this is the kind of thing you can put another little, um, like if you have a cute little platter thing to put up or just set it towards the front. You can put another, if you have like a pickle fork, that's actually kind of a nice thing to help to remove those cloves. I'm just going to leave it there. I have this awesome color going all through. Little breadsticks. Oh, good, Tina. You made the chutney and it's good. It's awesome. And like I said, I mean, once you make something like that once, your wheels start turning when you have different random ingredients, you know. Um, pear, finish it with a little sparkling wine. You know, if you have cherries or cranberries, those are so good. Dried apricots are really good in it, too. Um, try different spices, you know. Um, all that good stuff. Um, whole cloves and then remove those at the end. All right, last thing out of the oven. We've got our crostini. And yeah, 10 minutes is perfect. You can see that they started to kind of toast and dry out on the top, but they're not so crispy and crunchy that they're going to make you spill food all over yourself. So now we'll just kind of arrange them in here nicely. If you want to let them cool first, you can. I'm going to do that, and then I'll take a picture of my tray once it's all arranged. So please keep asking any questions, and not just about this. I mean, anything that you guys, you know, if you have five random ingredients and you want to know what you can make with it, I can help. Just let me know. If there's different videos that you would really like to have me post, as long as I have the ingredients, I'm, I'm game. We're having a lot of fun with this. So thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with me. Enjoy and celebrate. And we will see you soon.